know, when we have that, there's a whole lot going on in the country. And, and what I want to say to people is, you know, people, folks didn't, you know, they may, you may not see them, but they didn't go away. <laughs> okay, folks, <laughs> folks are still bubbling around whatever side they're on. Uh, there's a lot mm -hmm. of energy out there. It is showing up in other places. And so this is not the time um, to rest on our laurels in terms of standing firm around our conviction towards equity and justice and fairness and healing and health and well-being, those things, however we, we manage it in our lives. But again, I've just been taken aback by so much that I've seen and so much that is going on that I, you know, I just felt and kind of inspired to, to kind of talk about it. So for example, uh, for, for a while, if you said racist, now you, I'm going back some, but if you go back about, you know, maybe 15, 20 years, and you say racist, the images that show up in people's heads are Klansmen. You know, uh, you talk about white supremacists, you see full regalia. Okay, that's what people, you know, have generally thought of those horrible, you know, fringe individuals. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is, you know, they're not wearing hoods. Right. They stop wearing hoods. I mean, they probably do it for the parties, but, you know, they don't wear hoods to work. Mm -hmm but they most certainly go to work. And that work can be schools, it could be um, hospitals, it can be, um, you name it. And so there has been, now that there's been this kind of level of awareness, we've kind of narrowed our view of what we're, who we're talking about when we start looking at folks that are creating environments that are hostile. I spoke earlier today with some individuals about um, having to go to a job where as I approached the building, my stomach would start nodding up <laughs> as I got closer to my job. And at that point, I realized whatever it is that I'm doing in this institution is not worth what's going on in my body. Mm -hmm. I had to make that decision. So I work, I work at Sears, <laughs> you know, putting stuff I call, on. Remember I used to call, I called him black a couple of times to my last, the job before this job where I basically was like, the whiteness is overwhelming. I'm having heart palpitations, my chest <laughs> bothers me. I was like, if you need some um, some material on racial battle fatigue or the implications for stress um, and heart hypertension, what is literally killing us. Yeah, I'm taking, this is my sick day is really a break from the whiteness. And so of course- And I appreciate that you can say that now. Well, the thing is, well, yeah, well part of that is just being in the Northwest. Everybody want to be woke. So they were like, <laughs> Okay, all right. Have a good day. I mean, you know, but yeah, I, you have to protect your mental health, and, and you don't always have the luxury of being able to do that. Right. So I'm going to start off with a PowerPoint. Okay, who's under the sheets? Um, and what we mean by that is, you know, we have to start um, really taking a, a real honest view at the institutions. When we, you hear people constantly talk about structural racism and institutionalized racism and, you know, diversity, equity and inclusion. We have words that are rolling out there. But I think we need to do um, a, a specific look at who's under the sheets. So I start... Um, by looking at politics, law, and policing, I kind of put them together, starting obviously with Thomas Jefferson, who, uh, you know, basically talked about Black people as being another, you know, uh, distinct race, uh, that we were an inferior race uh, as it relates to our mental capacity and our endowments uh, physically as well, said we smelled bad. All of these things were, these were his words, which, you know, which he believed. And this is just a smart, small, small, just a clip of some of the things that he said. So I want to give people context for the folks that we see acting out right now. You know, if you have a moment, take a picture of this because you'll never see it in the textbook. Uh, but these are slaveholding U.S. presidents, which is part of the reason why it's so difficult for us to have a conversation about race, racism, because of the history uh, of the love of slavery um, by this country. Then you have James Madison that goes on to try to figure out, well, how do we count these Black folks? Because, you know, you all know about this better than you ever have, how important it is 
to, to count those people that are residing in a particular area, a particular state, and how important those numbers are. Well, of course, at the Constitutional Convention of 1787, uh, you know, the, those who are trying to abolish slavery said, you know, you cannot count this, these enslaved people. You say they aren't even human. Um, and of course, uh, those on the other side wanted to count uh, the enslaved Africans and the agreed upon compromise was that three fifths of the entire population would be counted um, instead of each person counted as a single individual. So three fifths of the entire population. And again, this gets folded into law very comfortably with a language, a level of language that you barely know that you have just assaulted demonized, dehumanized an entire group of people. Blacks are inhabitants, but as debased by servitude below the equal level, free inhabitants, which regards a slave as divested of two fifths of the man. What are we even talking about here? You barely know we're really talking about human beings. Um, and then you have Chief Justice Taney in 1857, um, arguing, uh, uh, following the passage in the Dred Scott case on whether in the eyes of the framers of the constitution, uh, that enslaved people were constituent members of the sovereignty and were to be included among those first three words of the preamble, we the people. We think they are not, that they are not included and were not intended to be included. They were for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order, altogether unfit to associate with the white race. And the most important line in this entire statement, and so far inferior, that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. That was the piece that I want you to, to link up with as you begin to see how this moves forward. So when we look at the origin of American policing, something I've showed you before, um, after slavery, there was a paranoid response to the fear of reprisal from freed slaves. Again, the ongoing fear up to 2021 is that black people are going to all get together and kill white people, attack them, fight them uh, for what they have done to black people past, present. Uh, and that never happened. But a little known or discussed piece of American policing is its predecessor, slave patrols, a system designed to control, mediate, and restrict the movements of Blacks through intimidating acts of terrorism and violence during and after slavery. Most scholars agree that this system of patrols paved the way for what we now have come to accept as American policing. Again, these become very important facts when we start talking about who you call to help you. President Woodrow Wilson, um, now we're moving in time, you know, he basically was one of the people that uh, promoted the film Birth of a Nation. He says, it's like writing history with lightning. My only regret is that it is all so terribly true. If you've ever seen Birth of a Nation, it is a pretty horrific, horrific film. This line has appeared in numerous books and articles over the past 70 years. The article this article that this comes from weighs the evidence that Wilson effusively praised in these words, one of the most racist major movies in American history. And of course, this is the leader of the country. Then you have David Duke. And again, to the, on the left in full regalia, there's no hiding who he is and what his beliefs are. Um, he is an American neo-Nazi, anti-Semitic, conspiracy theorist, far-right politician, convicted felon, former grand wizard of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. From eight, 1989, however, to 1992, he was a member of the Louisiana House of Representatives. His publications and politics are largely devoted to promoting conspiracy theories about Jews, such as Holocaust denial and Jewish control of academia, the press and the financial system, the Anti-Defamation League, has described Duke as perhaps America's most well-known racist and anti-Semite. Well, let's move forward. This is David Duke at Charlottesville, Virginia, August 2017. Again, we are determined to take our country back. I want to give you the, the understanding of the leadership, the institutions that they represent that have the power to cause injury. We're going to fulfill the promises of Donald Trump. That's what we believed in. That's why we voted for Donald Trump, because he said he's going to take our country back. Now, I don't know what you would think he means by our country, but I have a sneaky suspicion that it did not include, well, me or many of you that are viewing. 2020, the FBI threat of racist extremists 
on par with ISIS. Racially motivated violent extremism has been elevated to a national threat priority for the fiscal year 2020. FBI Director Christopher Wray told the House Judiciary Committee on Wednesday, this puts it on the same footing as ISIS and homegrown violent extremists inspired by foreign terrorist groups, he added. Now, the Department of Homeland Security made a statement a little later, October 6, 2020, white supremacists, the most persistent and lethal threat within the US. Now, again, th this is Homeland Security telling us, you know, it's not like they didn't know. I want you to look at the dates here. They were fully aware of how dangerous and pernicious these beliefs and the, this so-called fringe had, so much so that they were the single greatest threat to America. And just so you can, you can get some history here, this is Hitler's Nazi march in 1939, eerily similar to the white supremacist march of 2017. And then we look through and we begin to see a mayhem that we've never experienced inside the halls and people drawing guns. It's, 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 again, and these are just a few folks. So remember the theme here is who are you calling to help you? Who are you looking for to help you when you walk in a school, a university, a, a, a primary, a secondary school, when you walk in a doctor's office, when you call the police because you think there's something going awry? Who is it that you are calling to help you? And because of these positions, because of the power that is in, that's been invested in the, these institutions, we have to pay attention to this. Now, people of color are not surprised by this conversation I'm having. People of color have been concerned about this for quite a while. Again, a contrast to the laptop film. Uh, this is someone punching, literally fighting to the officers and you have someone kneeling you have someone here with a bloodied hand and you have a child now now this is not to suggest that the, in during the the black lives matter um protest there was not violence because that's not true there was violence but the majority of people were quite peaceful and tried to demonstrate in every way that they knew that they were not a threat and it did not uh stop the the violence from being perpetrated against them so let's look at a, a unique characteristic dehumanization and again, dehumanization becomes part and parcel for why it is that we don't, people don't feel empathy. This is a, a, a man that was, was caged in the Bronx Zoo in 1906. 114 years later, they apologized. Well, it's a little late. When he was released, this man, Odabinga, he shot himself in the head. More than a century after it drew international headlines for exhibiting a young African-American man in the monkey house, the Bronx Zoo in New York has finally expressed regret. Why do you think? <laughs> um, the Wildlife Conservation Society's apology for its 1906 exhibition of Odabinga, a native of Congo, comes in the wake of global protests prompted by the videotaped police killing of George Floyd that, that again shone a bright light on racism in the United States. Again, everybody's kind of jumping out there, but we have to look beyond the kind of symbolism and understand the entrenched beliefs and the entrenched hatred. Madison Grant, who was responsible for putting Odabinga on display in the, um, in the Bronx Zoo, uh, was uh, strangely enough, someone that was devoted to preservation of the redwood forest, species of deer, antelope, sea life, but he believed certain races of humans needed to be reduced or eliminated altogether, namely Jews, Mexicans, and African-Americans, along with the sick and disabled. His book, The Passing of the Great Race, touted to be the most famous book on scientific racism ever written, would win him the praise of Adolf Hitler, who stated, this book is my Bible. Grant believed strongly in forced sterilization, was instrumental in enacting um, enactment of strong immigration restrictions and anti-miscegenation laws in the U.S., citing the dangers of inferior races outbreeding or mixed breeding with whites. Now, I want you to continue to consider what we see, what we're hearing, and this backdrop of history that has been erased from our experience. In defense of the backlash from clearly African-Americans and others, this was the editorial in the New York Times. We do not quite understand all the emotion which others are expressing in the matter. 
It is absurd to make moan over the imagined humiliation and degradation Binga is suffering. The pygmies are very low in the human scale and the suggestion that Binga should be in a school instead of a cage ignores the high probability that school would be a place from which he could draw no advantage, whatever. The idea that men are all much alike except that they have had or lacked opportunities for getting an education out of books is now far out of date. That was his defense. And then we come to know now, I, I just want to know, did any of this make it to your textbooks? Anybody? Because it most certainly didn't make it to any of mine with all of my primary, secondary education through four degrees. Never did this come up that there were zoos, that Europeans created zoos where they would lock in, you know, in, enslaved Africans or, or people who had been from Africa, from uh, some Native Americans, they would lock in these enclosures and people would come through to see them in what they would consider to be their natural habitat. See, this didn't make it to my text, nor did this. This is a little girl in 1958 being, I was born in 57, being fed bananas in a zoo. So, so you can't be confused <laughs> about what's going on. You can't be confused when the very first black, black man to appear on the cover of Vogue magazine, LeBron James, was made into an animal. You can't be confused because even Vogue, Vogue didn't even have a really good answer except, oh, I, I think it's a coincidence. You look closely. Do you think it's a coincidence? That would be 2008. And then, of course, we have the coolest monkey and the survival expert. These are choices. That's 2018. Just saying. And then we have research. We have research that where people are actually looking at uh, the dehumanization of Black children. This is 2014. Social category children defines a group of individuals who are perceived to be distinct with essential characteristics, including innocence and the need for protection. The present research examined whether Black boys are given the protections of childhood equally to their peers. We tested three hypotheses. A, that Black boys are seen as less childlike than their white peers, B, that the characteristics associated with childhood would be less applied less when thinking specifically about black boys relative to white boys, and C, that these trends would be exacerbated in contexts where black males are dehumanized by associating them implicitly with apes. We expected derivative of these three principal hypotheses, that individuals would perceive black boys as being more responsible for their actions and as being more appropriate targets for police violence. We find support for these three, for these hypotheses across four studies using laboratory field and translational mixed laboratory field methods. We find converging evidence that black boys are seen as older, less innocent, and that they prompt a less essential concept of childhood. I think they're trying to get at that concept of empathy than do their white same age peers. Further, our findings demonstrate that the Black Ape Association predicted actual racial disparities in police violence toward children. And then this shows up, well, 2020. Just look at the sign. Muzzles, you know, and this is a protest for, well, masks, um, are for dogs and slaves. I am a free human being. How much more evidence do we need? Hence, I have no compassion or mercy in me for a society that will crush people and then penalize them for not being able to stand up under the weight. Friends, what I wanna to say to you is these are, this is real life and we have to pay attention. Let's look at medicine, finding the truth in plain sight, taken from Harriet Washington's book, Medical Apartheid, 2006. It is medical researchers themselves who have documented the proof of this long, unhappy history of African Americans as research subjects. Even so, this history has been a challenge to document because it has been hidden in plain sight, widely scattered, distorted, and rendered all but unrecognizable as abuse by heavy uh, editorializing. As I recall the years I've spent fettering out these experiments bit by bit, examining their patterns and probing the mindsets that they reveal, I am put in mind in the mind of the legal discovery process. A favorite ploy is to provide the opposing side with all the information it seeks, buried in towering mountains of unrelated or tangentially related documents. Similarly, I have perused dusty antebellum medical journals, the Surgeon General's Index, its success, successor, the Medline database, physicians' memoirs, and literary efforts 
slave narratives and painfully pick my way through foreign publications and alien tongues that are sometimes more forthcoming than domestic publications about the history of our medical treatment of minority groups. Mining the bright but thin loads within these resources, I gradually amassed a cachet of evidence. Let's look at this picture for a moment. This is a famous picture, Robert Thumb's uh, painting of J. Marion Sims' gynecologic surgeon on an oral representation of an experimental surgery upon his powerless slave, Betsy. The painting was commissioned and distributed by Park Davis more than a century after the surgeries. This is what was revealed. Thom portrays Betsy as a fully clothed, calm slave woman who kneels complacently on a small table, hand modestly raised to her breast before a trio of white male physicians. Two other slave women peer around a sheet apparently hung for modesty's sake in a childlike display of curiosity. This innocuous tableau could hardly differ from the gruesome reality in which each surgical scene was a violent struggle between the slaves and the physicians, and each woman's body was a bloody battleground. Each naked, anesthetized slave woman had to be forcibly restrained by other physicians through her shrieks of agony as Sims determinedly sliced, then sutured her genitalia. Harriet Washington requested to use the picture that I just showed you in her book. Pfizer Incorporated, the copyright holder, insisted on reading her chapter. Apparently unhappy with what they'd read, they refused to grant her permission or even respond to her query. This act of censorship exemplifies the barriers some choose to erect in order to veil the history of unconscionable medical research with Blacks. A preponderance of evidence. So 2019, New York Times prints this story of a 2016 survey of 222 white medical students and residents published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences show that half of them endorse at least one myth about physiological differences between black people and white people, including that black people's nerve endings are less sensitive than white people's. When asked to imagine how much pain white or black patients experienced in hypothetical situations, the medical students and residents insisted that black people felt less pain. This made the providers less likely to recommend appropriate treatment. Hmm, that's really convenient, isn't it? We feel less pain. That goes all the way back to J. Marion Sims and even further. That's also the reason why um, we don't have the same epidemic in terms of our addiction to pain medication. That's right. <laughs> the one time that the racism and discrimination saved this, us from being this. part of that, that particular health epidemic because you don't want to- Speaking to the new hero, the heroin epidemic right. that right. just arose. Just so now we'll look at education. I'm moving quickly because I have to move quickly and it's disturbing. Um, so we know that there has been a socialization process that it has impacted black people. Uh, Carter G. Woodson refers to it as a miseducation of the Negro. And he explains that the same educational process which inspires, and this is particularly important because this is like Black History Month, isn't it? Which by the way, Carter G. Woodson would, would be appalled. <laughs> he would be appalled because what he had created originally was Black History Week. And Black History Week was about showcasing what the students had learned through the year, that week to showcase what they had learned, their knowledge. Mm, it has become something quite different. Um, the same educational process which inspire and stimulate the oppressor with the thought that he is everything and has accomplished everything worthwhile depresses and crushes at the same time the spark of genius in the Negro by making him feel that his race does not amount to much and never will measure up to the standards of other peoples. The Negro thus educated is a hopeless liability of the race. Why? The difficulty is that the educated Negro is compelled to live and move among his own people whom he has been taught to despise. And how long have we been taught to despise who we are? As a rule, therefore, the educated Negro prefers to buy his food from a white grocer because he has been taught that the Negro is not clean. It does not matter how often a Negro washes his hands, then he cannot clean them. And no matter how often a white man uses his hands, he cannot soil them. I call that post-traumatic slave syndrome. But Carter G certainly knew and was way ahead of me on it. 
And then we calm ourselves by believing there's this somehow God-given burden to white people. This is taken directly out of a textbook in 1913. Problem of the Negro and the Indian, all the uncivilized races, essentially the same. Problem is how a relatively large mass of people inferior in culture and perhaps also in nature can be adjusted relatively to the civilization of the people much their superior in culture. How the industrially inefficient nature man can be made over into the industrially efficient civilized man. We're just trying to help you. It's our burden, you know, manifest destiny. And then we see bias show its ugly, its ugly, ugly face with children, little bitty children. I, I didn't count the slides I was just putting in there. And the reason why I'm showing you these slides is to show how the institution, stay with me here, the institution ingrained in them, ingrained in them its bias, ingrained in them at its very root are these same concepts and beliefs about Black people. I'm not making this up. And understand that we have to navigate this world. We've got to send our children into schools and we, can, we have to hope that they won't be harmed, that they're not those kinds of people because they don't normally show you their card. They don't tell you that, but it shows up in the hearts of our children, in their faces. It shows up everywhere, everywhere. So in this particular research study, 135 pre-K teachers were asked to watch a few short videos and told, press the inner key on the external pad every time you see a behavior that could be a potential challenge. Here's a deception. There was no challenging behavior. While the teachers watched, eye scan technology measured the trajectory of their gaze. Gilliam wanted to know when teachers expected bad behavior, who did they watch? What we found was exactly what we expected based on the rates at which children are expelled from preschool programs. Teachers look more at the black children than the white children, and they look specifically more at the African-American boy. Again, they took two children, white and black, both off task, both off task doing the same off task behavior, and the teacher didn't see the white child. The teacher only saw the black child. Albert Einstein, and Einstein alluded to this many, many times in different, in different statements that he made about you know, what is going to be needed in order for America and all of us as, as a people on a planet to move forward. He says he's, he's actually lecturing here to a, a group of African-American students at uh, Lincoln University, segregated, of course. My trip to this institution was on behalf of a worthwhile cause. There is a separation of colored people from white people in the United States. That separation... Now listen to what he calls it. That separation is not a disease of colored people. It is a disease of white people. I do not intend to be quiet about it. And he wasn't. But mm, this didn't make it my, to my text either. And when you start listening to what Harriet Washington said about what they did, what if you read her book and how much they took her through, because the implications are far and wide, Harvard, Yale, Johns Hopkins, every, you would be surprised that were implicated in experimentation of black, on Black people. And they didn't mean, even the people who supported her and endorsed her doing it had no idea that they themselves would come under the microscope. And so they went after her for it. But you got to know Harriet Washington to know that that's not going to work. So I want to take a moment and I want to look, show you one more piece. And then I'm going to get really directly up close with this idea of vetting. But what I wanted to show, all of us, you know, were there and for to see a lot of the violence that has gone on, uh, not just at the Capitol, Black Lives Matter, um, Charlottesville. And what I'm getting ready to show you is a piece from Charlottesville, but I want you to specifically focus in on law enforcement. The white supremacist. Most were nonviolent, but some black clad militant anti-fascist had come to fight. And while police looked on, the crowd grew more aggressive. A group of white supremacists formed up with shields and clubs and pushed straight into the protesters. Some of them fought back, but no one was arrested and the violence continued to escalate. At about noon, a group 
group of white supremacists cornered protester DeAndre Harris in a parking garage next to a police station. They beat him with poles, metal pipes, and wooden boards. Hey, hey, y'all cops, why is somebody dying in here? Come to your job. Come to your job. Come to your job. Come to your job. To your job. To your job. Police did not intervene to break it up. Then at 1.45, the brawling turned into something else, an act of terror. The reason why I wanted to show the police officers. So, we have a precedence. When the Capitol um, riots, insurgents, treason, whatever you want to call it, happened, you know, they, they decided to, um, when, when they had, you know, they, they, they later started thinking about, well, you know, we've got to protect the uh, senators. So they looked at the National Guard and they vetted them. They looked at the, they said, you know what, we need to check these National Guard, and guess what? They found 12 that were there, 12 that they had to eliminate, either for being connected to white extremists or criminal, straight up criminal violent act behavior and backgrounds, right? Now, I want, I want you to do the math here. They knew that they should try to vet them, that they may be dangerous. The people they called to protect them may be dangerous to them. Stay with me because this I'm emotional about this because this is hard for me. They protected them because they knew that they could possibly be some of those people. And what we have to live with, people of color in this country, we have to live with those very same people that are in uniform. Mm -hmm. We have to deal with them in every aspect of our lives and they're not vetted. Right. They're not vetted. And I'm saying we need to vet every police officer in America. And if they're not vetted, they most certainly can't come into communities of color. We need to vet teachers. We need to vet doctors because this is America. Only we've been coping with it the whole time and everyone goes, well, you know, it's just a fringe. Really? They didn't think it was a fringe enough for them to think that the armed guard could not be trusted. But there's so, a way to do it. I think people don't know the idea. And the thing about it is, is we've all known this to be true. We've all known that these biases show up in the people who are supposed to serve us, to protect us, and the people who are supposed to educate us and to care for us in the healthcare, uh, you know, settings. So, but what we're saying is there is a way to do that. You know, there is a way through not just these conversations, you know, through strategy, planning, action, and policy and law, because the thing about it is, if, if if you vet teachers, right? Person's really excited. They come out of Utah or somewhere, and they just want to teach, and they just they would love kids, and they don't think they have any biases, and they go and they get trained, and then they have to do this bias assessment, right? And they come out biased against Native American kids. Well, they don't get to work with Native American kids. You can still be a teacher. Go back and teach in Utah or Idaho. Go back and teach in, in um, rural Oregon. You could do that, but you can't teach these children because you've shown bias toward them. So I think that what we have to be strategic about at this point is since we know it works, when we know when it comes to people who they deem as important and valuable, that they will do it. We know they're not gonna think that we're important and valuable. So we have to create that and do it ourselves. That's the bottom line.